All right, so last time I was talking about the subject of drifting away. I was in Hebrews chapter 2, the beginning of Hebrews chapter 2, and I, and I spent some time talking about the subject of drifting away and that most people will look at it as you're going, once you have been saved, make sure you don't drift away from the salvation that you just entered into. But I personally think that what he's talking about is do not drift away from the salvation that we are speaking of in the sense of we are speaking of a salvation that we want you to get to. We want you to embrace. We want you to believe. Don't drift away from the direction that we are taking you. Don't drift away from the testimony that we are presenting about salvation. Go all the way to the point of being saved and don't drift away from the path that you are to take in order to get there. That is where I was at in the last message. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? And then the answer is, of course, you won't. All right, now what I'd like to spend some time talking about is the idea that there is something uh, that was testified of, that, that we have the testimony about this, that this is not something that just appeared out of the thoughts of the writer, but that this is something that was testified of, that was, that was spoken of. This is something that we heard about. We heard from the Lord Jesus, and we heard from those who heard him as an example. So we have testimony concerning these things. This is mentioned in Hebrews chapter 2 in verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at first began to be spoken by the Lord. The Lord did begin to speak of it. On occasion he would speak about it. His, his primary ministry, the ministry of the Lord Jesus, was the service, what he was trying to accomplish and, 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 and his purpose for being here when he was, was to bury people under the law, was to, was to teach the law and to show that there was no way that anyone could enter the kingdom of heaven. His disciples finally asked him at one point, well then, who then can be saved? And he says, well, with, with, with you, it's impossible. Yeah, with man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. It just needs to be done in a different way, you know, compared to this. How do you enter the kingdom of heaven unless you are as perfect as God? You will in no way enter the kingdom of God. That was the ministry of the Lord Jesus. But there were occasions when he did proclaim things that were related to the new covenant and uh, were related to the subject of salvation. But for the most part, it was a ministry of condemnation is what he was doing predominantly. All right. Um, in, the, in, the, in the beginning of this chapter, uh, it says, Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed. Chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard. All right. Again, this is about the testimony and that the Lord Jesus did come and proclaim a number of things. And based on his testimony, we need to take it seriously. That is the testimony that leads us to the point of salvation. Do not drift away from that. And what's important to recognize here is that Jesus told the truth. And we are to believe the truth. We are to believe what he had to say. In, in its proper context, we are to believe all that he had to say and, and understand why he said it, for the purpose that he said it for, who, who he was speaking to, why, how they would have understood what he was saying. All of that is part of the communication, but it's important to recognize that he had something to say. And what he had to say was important. It is important. It still is important today and will always be important. And so what he has to say needs needs to to it's something that you need to pay attention to. Right? It need we need to recognize 
the things that he had to say. And then the people who heard him, they had something to say as well. That's what uh, the writer goes on in verse 3. In verse 3, how should we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. And so by those who heard him, the disciples as an example, the, you know, we have we have the gospels that that were written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You know, we, we have the letter of uh, we have the letters of Paul who did not did not testify of him in the same way that the disciples did, but still, those who did hear him, they had something to say also. And so, you know, we need to pay attention to the things that they had to say. Take into consideration what they understood about what he had to say, and that this is important. All right, it really is. And in addition to the testimony of Jesus and of the disciples, the writer goes on, and in verse 5, no, I'm sorry, verse 4, the writer goes on, he says, God also, bearing witness both with signs and wonders with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his will, God himself has testified about this. And so the, the writer is speaking to the Jews, you know, he's speaking to the Hebrews. He was speaking to the Jews. The, the, the fact that, he, he, that the word Hebrew is used is kind of a generic term so that the, the Jews won't feel specifically targeted and might also perhaps assume that the writer uh, of this letter is, is not necessarily uh, uh, so well connected with them. You know, there's a, there's a lot that could be said about the choice of the word Hebrew here. But, uh, but regardless of that, the, the, the living God, God himself, has testified of this. He has had things to say through the miracles that he performed through the Lord Jesus that he was a part of, this, is, this, was, this was one of the ways that he gave his word, he gave his testimony concerning the significance of salvation and that it would only be experienced through the Lord Jesus. God himself has testified. And the Jews would have known that during that time because of the miracles that took place it was, it was beyond obvious that God was with him, that God was a part of what he was doing. People recognize that, not everybody, but in more than enough. And that, and, and that this is important, that God had something to say. He had something to say. And he said it through the miracles, through the, the, through the various signs and wonders and through the gifts of the Holy Spirit that he provided, through all of that, that's a way of recognizing that our God was a participant in this. He participated in the work that was being done collectively with Jesus and the disciples, witnessed by others. God had a part in what was taking place. He was an active participant, and he wants us to believe him. He wa God wants us to believe him. And in this case, if anything, just because of the miracles performed, just because of the signs and wonders, will you at least believe him because of that? And this is a theme that, that, the, that the writer uh, of, of this letter goes into more in chapter 3 with regards to the importance of believing God. That's what's coming next. And so in, 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 in chapter 2, verse 4, there is an introduction to what he's going to talk about more in chapter 3. This is an introduction to the significance and the importance of recognizing that God has something to say and that we are to believe him. You know, I'm sure you probably know people who, who, who relate to you in, in a way that you'd, you'd rather they didn't. But, you know, you, you talk with people and you can just tell that they, they simply have no interest in what you have to say at all. 
You know, you, you probably have people like that in your life, or at least to some extent, you've experienced people like that. They just don't, they don't care. They have no interest in what you have to say. And for those who will take the time to maybe listen to what you have to say, after they hear it, they may not even care, or they genuinely won't even believe what you had to say. And you could have been very honest. You could have been very truthful. You could, you could have been very sincere about what you were saying and, and, and the fact that you were wanting to communicate something important to this other person. And they either had no interest in what you had to say at all or whatever you said, they didn't even believe you. What kind of relationship can you have with a person who doesn't believe you? Now, look, if you're, if you're not telling the truth, then you clearly have no relationship and you are the one who has decided that there is no relationship between you and this other person. Because if you're not telling the truth, then it's just all fantasy. It's just, it's, it's not real. It's a fictitious, fraudulent experience, whereas there is no real relationship happening there at all. There's just you deceiving somebody, which is, which is not a relationship. It just isn't. I'm talking about a real, healthy, sound relationship. It is, it is necessary for there to be honesty and truth conveyed between the two persons. All right, even if, even if it's not true, but the person genuinely believes it, we have to, we have to account for that and, and have an allowance for that. At least it is, it is, at least a person is being honest about what they believe, even though what they believe is not true, is not real. At least they're being sincere about it. At least there is some, some, something that is real that is taking place there because of a real intent of a person's heart. But we have a God who genuinely desires to have an interactive relationship with us. He did these miracles and these signs and wonders through other people, participating with other people and those other people participating with him. That was, that was an experience of a relationship that he had with those people and the witnesses, those who would witness it or learn about it or hear about it. It's a way for God to have a small relationship with them by conveying the truth that he wants to convey through the miracles and the signs and wonders and the gifts that he, that he gives and that he does in the, way that he, in, the, in the way that he did that. So you can see that you have a God who desires a relationship with people he desires to have a relationship through participation, and he desires to have a relationship on the basis of what is real and what is true. And what we have here in verse 4, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 4, is an example of how we may know the heart of our God and the desire of our God, things that are of interest to him, what he would like, what he wants. It's a way of getting a little bit of a piece of, of an understanding of who he is in this way. All right, so we have the testimony that has been expressed by, by many, and we should take that into serious consideration. Moving on into a little bit of a different uh, transition, in a, into, a different, in a, into a different transition, a different area, he goes on and he, and, he, and, he, and he introduces the subject of angels again. This was just a little bit of a pause saying, you, you know, the Lord Jesus is greater than the angels. Let's take the truth seriously. And then goes back and speaks about the angels briefly again. But he does this in order to make a transition and speak a little bit more about the relationship that God has with the Lord Jesus. That clearly there was the existence of a relationship through the miracles performed, the signs and wonders. But he's going to talk a little bit more about that relationship with, with Jesus and a little bit with us as well. Here in Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, he says, for, for he has not put the world to come, of which we speak, in subjection to angels. It's a way of saying, you know, he didn't put, put the world to come, the kingdom to come, in subjection to angels or under the authority of angels. But one testified in a certain place saying what he, he did this, he, he, he's going to put the, put the world uh, to come in subjection to the king, the Lord Jesus. 
uh, again in verse 6, but one testified in a certain place saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor. All right, so he does go on and he does state in verse 9, but we see Jesus, that this was really all about the Lord Jesus, that all things will be subjected to him. But he does start out speaking about the creation of this earth and that things were subjected to us. I want you to understand this from the perspective of relationship uh, in this context, just just for this message, I like to speak of it. Speak of it from this point of view. That that when when God created the earth, and He put Adam and Eve as an example, He put Adam and Eve there in the garden. He established a relationship with them, and he and and what this relationship was 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 a relationship based on responsibility and authority, primarily. He gave them responsibility and he gave them the authority to fulfill that responsibility. Now, this was just in the Garden of Eden. And then, of course, it spread out beyond there. But but I want you to understand that, it, that we have a very isolated environment here on this planet. I know it's big, but it's not the universe. You know, it's not it's not the whole scope of the universe to include the spiritual dimension. What we have here is we have a planet, we have an earth, we have a creation of God, and he, he gave it to mankind to have a responsibility here to take care of it, to take care of the garden and to make use of it. And he also gave authority to exercise that responsibility. And of course, Adam and Eve, they both failed with regards to their authority. They went outside of the boundaries that they were supposed to to stay within. They used their decision-making inappropriately. And as a result, death entered into the world and we had a disaster. And I'll come back to that in just a few minutes. But I want you to see that there is a relationship between God and people who he, who he created. And this is on the basis of they had responsibilities and they were given the authority to fulfill that. But it was it was not as much. It did not have the same magnitude as that of the angels, that the angels had other responsibilities and other authority related to that. We don't have enough information to be able to really define just what that is. But I think that there is enough that, that we, we can know, that we can study and that we can see. I think there is enough to be able to make a comparison and say, that because of the responsibilities and the authorities that were granted to Adam and Eve, they were made lower than the angels in terms of authority. With the Lord Jesus, he also manif he was God manifest in the flesh and he, he, and he dwelt among us. He functioned within this world, within the limitations of this world, but after his resurrection and his ascension, he takes his position as the king and in sitting at the right hand of God. In addition to that, as I explained in, in, in chapter one, we, we, he then assumes more responsibilities and more authority. And this is greater. The responsibility and authority is greater than that of the angels. And that's, that's, that's fundamentally what he's talking about here. And so the testimony that was given to us by him, while it was significant just because he was here and because of God's participation in his testimony, um, you know, we should take into consideration who he is now. And that would give it even, even more validity and more importance that we should take the Lord Jesus seriously. All right, and so that's something that I wanted to share concerning uh, this section here between 
Hebrews chapter 2, verse 5 and verse 8, uh, with regards to the, uh, uh, the, the authority and the responsibility, and to have a little bit of a better understanding of what it means to have a relationship with our God. You, and you know, when he, when, he, when he establishes this relationship with us, he does give us a, a certain degree of responsibility in the sense that, that, that the things that he shares with us there is an expectation that it will become an integral part of our lives, of our life experience. And we have the authority to decide in what ways we will apply and make use of the things that he has shared with us. That's, that's one small way of understanding the relationship that we have. And, you know, when I first got saved, I first, I, I first related to God uh, as I related to him from the perspective of the Old Covenant. You know, the Old Covenant was an agreement. It was something that, uh, that, that, describes, uh, that described what, what the two different parties would do in, in this relationship that was defined. It was something that they agreed to. Uh, God said that, that there was a set of things that he would do, and there was also uh, the, the expectation of what the people would do. And the people had to agree. And they did. They said, all that you have said, we will do. You know, that's it, an agreement. So the old covenant, you know, from my perspective, was, was something that you, that you, you agreed to enter into. That it, that, it, that it was an opportunity for you to have this defined relationship with your God. And if you decided not to be a participant... You could decide not to be a participant. Now, from the Jewish perspective that I held to, uh, even if you didn't, dis even if you did not uh, participate, if you decided that you would not be a participant and you would not be an active uh, a person involved uh, in in living in obedience to the commandments that were given in accordance with the old covenant, that you still could quite likely have a place in the kingdom of God. In, 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 in the, the, the age to come, you know, that, that, that even, even if you didn't enter into the official agreement and you did not agree to do it all, that, that the Lord would still be merciful and understanding and, and to what degree you were recognizing his existence because you're Jewish and you're, you're one of the chosen people that, you know, that, that, that there, there would probably be a place for you anyway. I don't agree with that now, of course, but back then that was kind of my perspective of the covenant between God and I. My perspective was, you know, I, I have decided that this is what I will do. I will become a good person. I have decided that I will do that, and God has made a, has, has made a way, and he has established a definition for me to follow so that I can be a good person. I can be a respectable member of society, you know, stuff like that. Uh, but when it came to the new covenant, that's, you know, I kind of began to approach it in a similar way. You know, Jesus is the Messiah. Okay, I, I see that. I agree. I will acknowledge that this is the truth. Uh, okay, and you can be saved. So, all right, I'll go for that. That sounds pretty good. I'll, I'll agree to that. And, uh, uh, and, and that then, then later I discovered, well, there is an inheritance that I've received. And, and I thought, okay, I'll, I'll take that that part of it for now and a few other things later I'll agree to that kind of a thing and and then later on several years later as I was as I was uh, revisiting the subject of the new covenant again just personally I, I realized that there was really nothing to agree to you know it was it was not that kind of covenant it wasn't a covenant of I will agree to do all that you have said it was not a covenant of, uh, I will do this, this is my part, and you will do that, God, that's your part. That's not the kind of covenant that the new covenant is. The new covenant is, you will believe this, you will believe the truth, or you're toast. You know, it's either believe or die. Be saved or not. You're either dead or alive. That's it. You're dead in your trespasses and sins, or you are alive in Christ. And this is 
This is exactly how, you know, in, in, in the definition that he gives, this is exactly how a person can be saved. You either take it or leave it, and it is not something that you agree to. It is something that you surrender to. You know, and that was that is a different word. That is a word that has a different meaning to me personally. It expresses a degree of authority that's different from what I was kind of accustomed to as a religious Jew. In this case, God asserts his authority and his, you know, his responsibility to to provide a means by which I can be saved because he's the only one who can do it. But he asserts his authority in the sense of, of he requires a person to just simply surrender. You must surrender. And surrender means accept all the terms unconditionally or you die. And that's the proper way to view the relationship that gets that, 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 that we have with our God as it, as it is initialized or how it is initiated through the new covenant. He says, this is it. This is the boundary. This is the definition. There is no other way to begin to have a relationship with God. You must first surrender to these terms. And, uh, and that was a very important moment for me in my faith to, to discover that and to, and to recognize that considering all that was testified of considering all that was said uh, by, by our God, by the Lord Jesus, by the people who heard him, all of that. All right, so pressing forward, let me go back to verse 8. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 8, it says, You have put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. All right, so, so in, 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 in what he accomplished through asserting Jesus as the king, as the king of kings, after he accomplished his work of salvation for the world, all things were then put in subjection under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. In other words, he's not asserting that kind of authority to the magnitude that you probably would, or in the pro I probably would, he's, he's, he's not asserting the magnitude of his authority because, fundamentally because, he wants people to turn to him out of choice because they want to know who he is, as I explained earlier in previous messages, that he wants people to turn to him because they want to know him. If he asserts his authority to the absolute magnitude so that it would be obvious and we would see it clearly, then he would probably have to give up uh, the opportunity for people to turn to him because they wanted to. They would turn to him because they recognize that they're really, it's so, it's so uh, unbelievably obvious that there is no other way, there is no alternative, that it's just what you do because that's just the way it is. All right, and so he's, he's asserting his authority gradually and in steps, in stages, and he is doing so a little bit at a time in order to accomplish greater purposes, which is to have a people who, who become a part of his life because they want to be a part of his life. Uh, but again, they have to surrender, not, not just go enter into some kind of negotiated agreement of some kind with God. All right, but we, in verse 9, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. So he uses all the things that he said before to re repeat it again, and while doing so, introduce a few new things to introduce a few new things. This is a transitionary statement to say, now based on all these things that we know about him being crowned with glory and honor, based on the fact that we know that he is the one who is made a little lower the, than the angels, but he's now given a position higher than the angels, based on all this, let's throw a few more little items in here. And the additional items have to do with being crowned with glory and honor, that he might taste death for everyone. Now, we're going to introduce the topic of death 
introduce the topic of forgiveness, introduce the details concerning how we get saved. How we get saved. Do not drift away, but, in, but, but go all the way to the point of salvation itself. The writer is introducing the topic of salvation here about the importance and the significance and the effect of the death of the Lord Jesus and the subsequent resurrection through which he has been crowned as the King of Kings because he's alive. He introduces this and then goes to verse 10 where he says, For it was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation, that theirs is about salvation, perfect through sufferings. That the Lord Jesus experienced sufferings and that there was a perfection that was revealed through that. Now, you could read this and say that, that Jesus was made perfect in the sense that he was not perfect before, but he is perfect now. I don't see that. I don't see that at all. I think that this word is a way of saying that, 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 that uh, there is a completion that occurs, that there is something that is fitting that occurs, but that also the, that there is a perfection of God that is revealed. Again, that there is a perfection of God that is revealed because of the sufferings that Jesus experienced. Not that Jesus was all of a sudden made perfect because he was imperfect, but this is an opportunity to see the perfection of God through the sufferings. As an example, the forgiveness of God, how would we ever know that outside of what took place here? Or the love of God, we would never understand the magnitude and the significance of many aspects of the love of God, if it wasn't for the sufferings that were experienced and through the things that took place in order to accomplish salvation. And so there's a lot of the character and the person of our God and his perfection that would have never been understood and realized until the Lord Jesus did what he did through the death and resurrection that he accomplished and through the salvation that he provided, that kind of perfection is what I believe the writer is referring to. But now, something I want you to understand is that there, there are a few words that are used here that he might, in, in verse 9, for example, that he might taste death. And in verse 10, he speaks about suffering and that it was fitting. You know, there is a lot being said in these two verses, in verse 9, and also in verse 10, there's a lot being said here in a very small space. And, and this is all going to be a little bit more unwound in the coming chapters. All right, this is important for you to understand is that there's a lot being said here. It's a huge package packed into a very small space. And, and, and that there's a lot to be said about what's here. Uh, what I'd like to do in this case, I think it's best to go and look at a larger section in the scriptures uh, where, where these words are used and, and where, where I believe if you understand this other section in the scriptures, in Romans chapter 5 is where I'm going to turn. If you, if you will spend some time studying through Romans chapter 5 and then go back and look at Hebrews chapter 2 verses 9 and 10 closely, I think you will see the parallel, that this is a parallel passage in the scriptures, that, that, that whoever, whoever wrote this letter, which I believe is the Apostle Paul, uh, used words and phrases and, and an idea that is well conveyed in Romans chapter 5. So, you know, I personally believe that Paul, Paul wrote both of these sections, and so I, I feel very comfortable in turning to Romans chapter 5 and say, let's review this. And then we can go back and look at Hebrews chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, and, and we can see, uh, see some of the, the, the words that were chosen and how they represent a lot of the ideas that were conveyed in Romans chapter 5. In Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 8, he has a, 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 very, a very profound description of the gospel. And it's important to, to, to review this and realize this. And then from verse 12 as well, 
uh, going on from verse 12, we have a description of the comparison between Adam and the Lord Jesus and, and how sufferings entered into the world. This is a very important section because I will use this. I would use Romans chapter 5 verse 12 to the, to the end of the chapter to convey uh, how suffering and sin had entered into the world through the one man, Adam, but, but this was used in order to accomplish salvation so that salvation and life could enter into the world through the Lord Jesus. And I believe that Hebrews chapter 2 verses 9 and 10 uh, speak of this and that here we can see the details uh, much better in this chapter right here in Romans chapter 5. In Romans chapter 5 beginning in verse 8 it says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. All right, this is a way of saying that his love was demonstrated. His love is perfect. God is perfect. The perfection of God would, was manifested, a part of it, in this way, such that you know, we would never been able, never, we, we, we would have never been able to know this part of his perfection outside of this type of suffering. Again, God, God, dem, uh, God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And this is important to see in verse 9. Much more having been justified by his death, by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. There is, there is a separation. There is a difference between what he did through his death and what he did through his life. There is a difference. We were justified by the death of his son, and, and, and that's, that's an important thing. But if you want to be saved, salvation happens through something else. Keep reading in verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, reconciled, justified, things like that. We were made right with God to an extent in the sense that the sin issue came to an end. In the sense that the sin issue came to an end by his death, much more having been reconciled, after this is an accomplished fact, after this has taken place, after this is resolved, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. We are saved by his life. Now, this is how this works. It's, it's in two parts. Salvation is in two parts. It has to do with the problem and how he solved this problem. The problem was that sin entered the world through the decision of Adam and Eve, and death resulted from sin. Physical death, of course, but primarily it was a spiritual death. The spiritual death was the absence of the life of God. All right, when somebody dies, you don't check and see, is death there? Do we see any death? No. We check and see, is there any life? And if there is no life, then we declare that a person is dead because of the absence of life. So also, it, it, so, so it is also with uh, what happened with Adam and Eve in the day that they ate from the wrong tree and that day they surely died and it was the absence of the life of God. It was the absence of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God was breathed into them and they became living beings. But when they sinned, when they didn't believe God, when they rejected God, he left. That was it. He left. He departed from within them and left them in a condition such that they did not have the Spirit of God within them. The Holy Spirit was not there. The life of God was not there. It was the absence of the life of God that caused them to die, and they died spiritually. They were still physically alive for a while, but this was a spiritual death. And so there were two issues that needed to be resolved. You have to resolve the sin issue, 
and you have to resolve the absence of the Holy Spirit within his creation. And this is what the Lord Jesus did. He died on the cross. The crucifixion was about resolving the first part, which was the sin issue, the sin problem, the problem of sin, the existence of sin. He died for the sins of the world once and for all, the just for the unjust. The sins of the entire world were forgiven at that one point in history when Jesus died on the cross. That was it. At that, from that point forward, sin was, is no longer a topic for God. It does not hold our sins against us anymore. Now you've got a whole bunch of forgiven people, a whole bunch of forgiven dead people, but they're forgiven at least, right? They're forgiven people, a bunch of forgiven dead people. You want to make these people alive? You've got to restore life, the life of God. The Spirit of God must reindwell His creation. And, and so for those who recognize their need for forgiveness, and we recognize our separation from God, and we rec recognize we don't know who he is, we recognize that we are dead to him, we can be the recipients of the free gift of the life of God, the Holy Spirit. And when we believe the truth concerning the gospel of sin, death, forgiveness, and the restoration of life, he will restore to us his spirit. He will make us alive. And because there is no sin that was left unforgiven, all sin has been resolved, there is no sin left that could be held against us that would cause the Holy Spirit to depart from within us. And so the life that we have is an eternal life. It is an everlasting life. By definition, the life of God, the Holy Spirit dwelling within you will never leave because there is no sin you can ever commit that has not already been forgiven. And so you have eternal life. You have everlasting life. And so just as sin entered in through the one man, Adam, and death entered in through the one man, Adam, so also through the, through, through the work of the Lord Jesus, the one man, Jesus, through his work, he resolved death and he restored life. And he did this through sufferings. And so just as sufferings entered into the world because of the one man, Adam, sufferings were used. It was through sufferings. It was fitting. It was through sufferings that the one man, Jesus, would then provide for forgiveness and for the restoration of life. It is not a prophecy. It is not a foreshadowing. It just fits. You know, that's the right, that's the right, right word to use in this case. So beginning in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, I'll read ahead a little bit to, to give you a feel for this. In Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus, thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. And then moving forward into verse 14, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. There in verse 15, a type of him who was to come. He speaks of the type, of the, 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 the fitting nature of what is going to happen later. He begins the subject of that in verse uh, in, in verse. 14, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense, for if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man Jesus Christ abounded to many. All right. So read through the rest of this section here, Romans chapter 5, verse 12, down to the end of the chapter. In verse 21, at the end of the chapter, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the correlation. 
After you study this, then I think you'll have a better appreciation for what's said here in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Going back to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering, in a, sense of, in, in a way of saying, for the purpose of engaging in sufferings, the suffering of death, so that for the purpose he would be crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, see that word grace of God, as it was used also in Romans chapter 5, might taste death for everyone. Again, death for everyone. This is the theme. These are the, are the phrases. These are the words that are used in order to help you to understand that, that, uh, you know, that, that this correlates very well with what he was talking about in Romans chapter 5 with regards to salvation. In verse 10, for it was fitting for him, fitting, Fitting as I used that as I was reading through Romans chapter 5 to help you understand that this is not really a prophecy. It's just the way. It is the way that God decided to do this, and it fits. Fits very well. For it was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Again, referring to the sufferings that had entered into the world through the sons, through the generations, through the people that have suffered all this time, that there is a way to bring them to glory and that the Lord Jesus, the head, the, the, the captain, the king, the one who will lead the charge, the one who will take power, the one who is worthy of such power, who will fulfill the responsibility of providing for salvation, who will assert proper authority. This guy, the Lord Jesus, that's the one. All right, and so that's uh, what I wanted to present uh, concerning uh, Hebrews chapter 2 in this section between, uh, between verses, uh, uh, mainly between verses 5 and and 10 here, but I, I was able to spend a little bit more time talking about the significance of the testimony between verses 1 and 4. Uh, so with this, I, I you know this is a good place to pause until the next message. I got a question for you here, a couple of questions that I think you can work with a little bit. Uh, one is, what was your experience of beginning to believe God, as I mentioned earlier about, about the testimony of, of Jesus, that Jesus testified? And we are to believe him. Uh, the disciples testified of what they heard and saw. God himself testified. What, what was your experience in beginning to believe these truths? What were some of the transitions that you experienced, some of the struggles that you had to begin to really believe the testimony that was presented here? You know, some people don't have much to say about that, but, but some of you may have a lot that you can share that can encourage the people who are with you in your small group, please take the time to, uh, to consider talking about something like that. I also mentioned uh, the difference between entering into the new covenant as an agreement or entering into it as something that you would surrender to. And you may not be able to relate to it in the same way that I do in, in terms of, of seeing the difference between agreement or surrender. And that's fine. You don't need to. But some of you might relate to that just as I did and, and realize that, you know, maybe this is something uh, that, that, that you've been struggling with, that you thought that you kind of made some kind of an agreement with him instead of realizing that you really did surrender to him absolutely. And so if there's some way that you feel that you may be able to relate to that, share, share that, you know, with, with folks, that this is something you could share. And then something for, uh, for, for next time mainly to talk about uh, is with re relationship to perfection. Uh, and that is how would you uh, understand or see the perfection of God. I hinted at this a little bit with regards to the love of God and the forgiveness of God. I'll talk about this more in the next message. But but how would you um, see the perfection of God? How could you see God and say that you know him in his perfection? You know something about the perfection of his love as you as you would be able to relate to that in the sense of his forgiveness. And if that's a little bit too much, then don't worry about it. I'll, I'll explain more about this in the next message. Okay, so thank you for spending some 
time with me on this one and and uh, we you know we can we can talk more about more about this subject in the next message let's pray dear god thank you so much for this time that we can review the importance and the significance of the testimony that has been passed on to us and thank you that we can we can take some time to review and think more about the details of just what the gospel is and what it's about and so that we can see many of these verses in the scriptures in, in a more complete way that we may have we may have not been able to see before that we may have just passed over easily without considering the magnitude of 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 all that you 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 could very well have said and expressed and help helped us to understood if we would have just understood the gospel a little bit more clearly. And I thank you for this time and opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.